the word radical. You know, why do I stick that word in front of eco-psychology? Well, um, the word radical comes from the same place as the word radish, right? <laughs> so they come from the same root, and they, they mean root. A radish is a root vegetable, right? So to be radical means to go to the roots. And whenever anybody says, you know, oh, that's just treating the symptoms, that's not getting to the root causes, that's a radical statement. That's taking a radical position, right? And it's, people often get confused and say, well, you know, being radical means, you know, you're a, you know, some sort of extremist or some kind of Marxist rebel. Um, but that's all I mean by the term. And then it's about following where that goes. Where does that take us, right? So, um, so being a radical does mean questioning our mainstream systems, right? Insofar as they're dealing with our collective problems in a way that really doesn't get to the bottom of things, right? So if we've got this collective global crisis um, and the status quo um, doesn't address those roots, then we're just um, fostering certain illusions or self-deceptions in, in our actions, right? So it really is about saying um, our collective problems are contained within our conventional ways of doing things, right? So if we're going to solve the problem, we have to question those conventional ways, those conventional systems, whether they be intellectual or cultural or political economic, that if the problem is intrinsic to those systems, then those systems themselves must change. Okay. Um, and I think it's also important to recognize, and this you know, ties right into eco-psychology, um, that ecology itself is inherently radical um, because it conceives reality in terms of interrelationships, which is something that our uh, mainstream systems, right, they don't do which is why we're in this mess in the first place, right? So right away, um, any time you ecologize a field, whether it's economics or feminism or psychology, you're right away radicalizing it. That's a very strong point I like to make, that as soon as we put eco in front of something, we're automatically making it radical, right? Because we're thinking now in terms of interrelationships, which challenges our dominant ways of thinking and practicing. Okay, so what I'm saying is that eco-psychology, because it's got that eco, uh, is inherently radical. But not everybody sees it that way. Um, and right now there's a movement called, I don't call it a movement, but a development called second generation eco-psychology. And some of the thinkers in second generation eco-psychology think, well, we can have a mainstream eco-psychology for people who want to do it that way and then we can have a radical eco-psychology for people who want to do it that way. And for me, that just doesn't work. Because if we're, if we're doing eco-psychology, we're doing something that's radical. And I stick that word radical in front of eco-psychology just to make that clear. It's a kind of a strategic move, right? To make sure that we're in that, we're on that page, right? And I'm trying to encourage, you know, developments within the field, forms of scholarship and practice, that take that understanding as its starting point, right? So it's about really underscoring that because anytime you're doing something radical, there's this incredible pull to bring it into the mainstream, to neutralize it, you know, to take the sharp edges off it, to smooth it over. And um, I'm trying to guard against that happening because the, the forces that want to do that are very strong. Okay, so the final point I want to make about why I'm using that word radical, or how I'm using the word radical, um, is that I use it really in two senses. I'm saying eco-psychology is radical in two senses. Um, so the first is what I call recollective, right? And all the participants in my course are probably getting tired of that phrase, right? Um, but I use it over and over again. Recollective means um, we're recalling, we're remembering that the psyche is deeply rooted in the earth. 
So the psyche emerges from the earth, and um, when we split psyche from nature, that gets forgotten. Right? That's what we mean by the alienation from nature. So, um, and when we do that, a particular kind of you know sickness sets in, right? Um, so, this sense of eco psychology is about you know the soul's need to really place itself in a poetic vision of the cosmos, right? To understand its kinship with the natural world, um, and a lot of eco psychology really goes strong on that, um, and often is what people understand eco psychology to be. But I'm saying there's also this second sense of eco-psychology, which I call its critical sense. Right? And this is about addressing the social forces um, that violate nature, right? both our own human nature and the larger, more than human natural world. Right? And so this is about identifying the historical and cultural and political and economic roots of the crisis, of our eco-psychological crisis, if you want to put it that way. So the way I've been illustrating that in the course is with a triangle. And again, you know, for those of you in the course, hold on, because there's, there's a circle coming, and I haven't done a circle yet. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to go through the triangle to get to the circle. So uh, if we put psyche here, and, you know, it's about understanding psyche in, in a kind of way that for those who are with the Satish today understand it, in terms of spirit um, or breath or, you know, um, it's the realm of interiority, right? And it's, we could also say, you know, part of this is human nature. Psychology is the study of human nature. It's, it's our nature from the inside. So we have psyche and then we have nature here. Right. And so that recollective eco-psychology is about the interrelationship between these two things. In our culture we split them, right? So philosophically that's called a dualism, where you say these are two completely separate realities. Uh, in psychological language it's called a dissociation, two things that optimally would be associated with one another get split apart. Right, so there's a split here. So recollective eco-psychology is about mending that split. And that's, that symbol there, psi, means psychology. Right, right. so um, that's recollective eco-psychology. And um, critical eco-psychology, though, where's that on the diagram? Well, we've got society over here. Right. And so I said critical eco-psychology is about understanding how uh, nature gets dominated, <coughs> exploited, violated, right? including our own human nature. Right. So critical eco-psychology kind of runs this way. So critical. Society, nature, psyche. Right, and um, there's lots of ways of connecting what goes on in these sides of the triangle as well. So there's a field called critical psychology, right, and it belongs here. Right, so critical psychology. Just as recollective eco-psychology is protesting and overcoming the split between psyche and nature, critical psychology is protesting and overcoming the split between psyche and society. Right? It's critical psychologists say, we've got a society that generates uh, narcissism, which is a very self-involved way of being in the world. It generates depression, it generates uh, addiction. Um, you know, there's this incredibly tight interweaving between psyche and society. I was sharing today, I always have this idea that there's this, um, you know, dictum to know thyself. And for me, I've, I've discovered that to know myself, I have to understand capitalism. 
right? because capitalism has done so much to shape me and my mind. Right? And so capitalism is down here. And between society and nature, um, this is the realm. What's the interrelationships between society and nature? Because we split there too. We deal with nature separate from society. Right? So who's overcoming that split? Well, radical ecologists. Or what's sometimes called ecology. Sorry about that. But sometimes called political ecology. Understanding ecology in terms of um, political economics. Right? And radical ecology includes ecofeminism and deep ecology for people who are familiar with these fields, social ecology, and also eco socialism. And Excuse me, ecosocialism is the approach I'm most interested in because, in my view, it characterizes our society most accurately, right? And deals with it most directly. It's saying um, our society is a specifically capitalist one, and if it's, that's what characterizes a society, then this whole process requires that we have a good understanding of capitalist society if we want a different kind of society. If our goal is an ecological society, right, and I assume we're all kind of wanting to go that way, what's our existing society? How do we, you know, how do we name what we're coming from and where we're going? Right? And how do we understand our existing society? And because there's such an extreme ideological taboo against questioning capitalism, um, you know, Margaret Thatcher, there's no alternative, Tina, right? We constantly dance around this. And environmentalists over here, for me, um, capitalism's kind of the elephant in the room, right? Um, so I'm an environmentalist, so I have to get behind cap and trade programs and, you know, credit, um, carbon trading, you know, that's all using the system that created this problem to try to solve it, right? Um, environmental groups often have like corporate funding, right? So don't bite the hand that feeds you, right? So I've, I've been really attracted to eco-socialism. Um, and we've had to talk a fair bit in the course about what that means because a lot of people get a little nervous about that word socialism. Um, so I'll just say, you know, broadly, because I don't want to spend the whole talk on this, um, it means nothing like what happened in the former Soviet Union or what's going on in China right now. Um, those are forms of state capitalism, not socialism. You know, what Marx had in mind has never really happened. And um, he was an incredible thinker, he was a humanist, and he was actually in, interested in um, individual freedom not totalitarian states and bureaucratic nightmares. Um, he was saying that we need a society that acts as a platform for our spiritual development. That's what he meant by socialism. And he opposed capitalism because it degraded our humanity and alienated us, including from nature. So I found him you know, an incredibly powerful source, and we've got Joel Covell coming in next week who's one of the leading theorists in the field, and so he's going to help us understand that a little better. But what are we doing, what am I doing with all of you know, these different approaches? Well, part of the um, ideology of capitalism is to um, suck the psyche out of nature and society back up into the psyche and make it an individual thing. Right? And then if I'm depressed, it's my problem. It's not because I'm alienated from the natural world or not because I live in a loveless society. It's because I don't have enough serotonin in my brain. Right? Or, you know, I got some other problem. I just can't get over something. Um, 
So that's, a, that's an ideological move, and it does a number of things. One, it takes psyche out of nature. So it, um, the word that's often used is it deanimates the natural world. It takes the spirit out of nature and leaves behind um, this kind of brute matter. Right? And for capitalism to do its thing, to get going with the bulldozers, we need a nature that looks like that. Right? If it's full of spirit and if we, our souls are incomplete until we've developed you know, relationships with you know, all the plants and animals and you know, developed a deep bond with the land, if we have all that stuff going on, how can you do capitalism? So you have to withdraw the psyche out of nature, leave this brute matter behind, and then you know, go blast away. Right? Similarly here, you've got to pull a psyche out of society make it an individual thing, so society can just keep going on doing what it's doing without being implicated in all this pain and suffering that's going on. In fact, it feeds on it. Right? We need narcissists, we need empty people who will consume and consume and consume in order to deal with their pain. Right? Mm -hmm. Capitalism is a system based on you know, uh, limitless expansion. You've got to keep piling up more capital every year. Right? We, in this society, we're not in service to life, we're in service to accumulating capital, right? And that whole process uh, degrades life, right? So we're all serving a society, you know, and all of our pension funds and all of that, we're all putting our efforts into this system um, that winds up uh, violating life um, according to its own laws of motion. It can't do otherwise, right? So, the basic move in eco-psychology, um, it's a coin that was termed uh, by David Abram, but maybe also James Hillman, because they both kind of use similar language. I don't know what you think, Mary Jane, but turning the psyche inside out, or Hillman says turning the soul inside out. And um, so you take this little point and you pull it out like this, and you get this enormous field of relationships that includes the natural world and our society. And to conceive the psyche ecologically um, is to conceive of the psyche in terms of interrelationships, because that's what ecology means. So we've got this enormous field of relations, which means um, that and this is another line David Abram uses, the philosopher. He was, when was he here? Just like a month ago or something? <laughs> Two weeks ago, yeah. Um, he's fond of saying this, so is Hillman. We're in the psyche. The psyche isn't in us. Right? We're constantly generating psyche through our relations with one another, with the land, with our social relations within our society. Um, and if that's so, then reality is psychological through and through. It's not just something that's sucked inside our heads, right? It's something we collectively generate. And so the careful tending of our relationships is doing psychology. Right? So what that means is, this gives us a totally different image of the psyche. You know, it's this generated within this field of social relations that include our social relations with the natural world. Right? And if we've got a totally different image of the psyche, then we need a totally different image of psychology and its practice. Right? So, um, what that amounts to is a radical transformation of psychology. Right? So, eco-psychology um, is not about for me, doing psychology anything like how we're doing it now. Right? So if we need you know, to understand social relations, then we need to have an analysis of capitalism. We need to understand history. We need to understand critical social theory. If we're going to do this, you know, we need to get into all those kind of marginalized ways of doing psychology, like you know, depth psychology and transpersonal psychology and experiential psychology and all the kind of green spirituality that's going on, and we need to find a way of putting some scholarly legs under that stuff and bring it in, out of the margins and into the center, because that's how you weave this back together, and that, in fact, is why those schools of psychology have been marginalized, because they're the ones that are most open to our relationship with the natural world. So we've got this triangle, 
And it's still a little confusing, and people, you know, in the course have been saying, well, you know, I don't like eco-socialism, or why do you want us to be eco-socialists? And I'm saying, well, I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that's one part of the, the limb of the whole thing, and we're trying to do something that's never been done before, that's, that's creative, right? The word nature comes from the Latin natura, and it means birth, right? That's what the word nature means. It's not a thing, it's a process. It's, it's the creativity of life. So to be ecological is to to participate in those transformations and metamorphoses and creative acts that respond to life, right? So let's, let's park the triangle for the moment. Circle! Circle. <laughs> right. Let's talk about society of nature. human society, and let's make human society a subset of the society of nature, because it's one big field of social relations. And this term society of nature comes from ecological anthropology, so you might as well write ecological anthropology here. So who thought psychologists would have to study ecological anthropology? But we do. Because ecological anthropologists study societies where it would be inconceivable to think that you don't have relationships with the natural world. Personal relationships. Right? And to think of that whole um, arena, like to, to conceive of human society separate from nature, it's just not in the vocabulary. Right? And it's not about trying to mimic those cultures, those societies, but it is to understand that um, this is a way to rethink the relationship between human society and the natural world. And to understand that this border here, Marx would say that's where the, the metabolic interaction between human society and the natural world takes place. And he actually coined the phrase that there's a rift right there. There's, an equal, there's a metabolic rift there that alienates us from the natural world. And, and you know, in, in his day, in Marx's day, the ecological crisis was in terms of soil degradation and pollution and Malthusian worries about population. And, and he was all over those things. And uh, he, he wrote quite a lot about agriculture and was studying, um, you know, the kind of leading edge agricultural thinkers of the time. And he named the alienation of human society from nature as foundational to capitalism. Right? So this is a way of trying to say we need to tend that boundary and then think of human society within this larger um, field of relationships, right? And this brings psyche, nature, and society together in circles rather than triangles. Um, okay. So how's my time? Getting there, right? So what do I want to say? Um, so what this also does is brings the recollective sense of eco-psychology and the critical together, because those two interrelate as well. Everything interrelates, right? So um, if we're going to recall um, our embeddedness in the earth, our spiritual and emotional embeddedness in the earth, then that's going to make it pretty vividly clear how um, violating of life our culture is, and that's going to raise some critical thinking. And the more we do that critical thinking, the more we understand um, we need to engage in sort of cultural regeneration and social transformation that makes a space for that recollection, because it's hard to do that under the existing conditions, right? So um, one last thing to note about this vision of a, you know, we could call this as a society of nature, we could call it this human society, an ecological society. And basically my idea here is that right now we have um, people like me, I'm a psychotherapist, um, and the critical thinker Jürgen Habermas coined this phrase, therapeutocracy. <laughs> therapeutocracy. Right? And because, and it, just to use a bit of his language, because the political economic system so colonizes 
and um, uh, parasitizes what's called the life world, the everyday world of you know our families and our education and um, our gains and our you know our day to day life becomes more and more corporatized. So you know kids are brand identified by the time they're three or something, right? There's this there's this increasing colonization process, and what that does is creates a whole series of um, social pathologies, um, like a loss of meaning and, uh, you know, huge rates of psychopathology, which means things like depression and anxiety. And, um, so he's mapped this whole way of understanding the effects of this kind of political economic system um, on, um, you know, the, the wounding that it does to us. And because it does that, this kind of system, because it serves the accumulation of capital rather than serving life, that makes a therapeutocracy necessary. Right? So we need people, we need social workers, and we need psychotherapists, and we need psychiatrists, we need this whole fleet of people to deal with the damage that the system's causing. So my idea here is that we don't need a therapeutocracy, one, because we're serving life instead of capital, Right? And that means we've got a whole way of caring for the human life cycle. Right? So we're bonding our kids to the natural world and um, you know, we're building a culture that is full of um, rites of passage for the youth and caring elders. Um, Bill Plotkin's coming in a couple of weeks. He talks about how you know, you know, when we get to our senior years in this society, this culture, uh, he calls that stage pasture and playtime. Right? We put we put our seniors out to pasture, or we let them go play. <laughs> right? Right? And so, in this kind of society, that wouldn't be happening. Right? We'd have we'd have wise elders. Right? And so, integrated in this whole system, um, I call this replacing. After uh, a friend Rona Trotter calls it um, replacing therapists with elders, which is kind of a shorthand for a whole society that's, because it prioritizes life, is carefully tending the soul of the natural world and the soul of each person, you know, going through their life cycle, right? And so it's that caring process that we relegate now to the therapist, you know, we, you know, get all these wounded souls lining up at the therapist's office and writing their checks at the end of the session. Uh, instead of that, you know, we've got um, it built right into the society, right? So those functions are now being carried um, by people and the quality of their social relations, right? So you don't have to go to a therapist to find some love, right? Because it's, it's built into the culture. Okay. So, um, just a few quick words about you know, I, I don't know a lot about transition. I'm familiar with where we live, Jill and my wife here. We live in near a town called Perth, and there's a transition Perth. And as far as, you know, the conversation there has gone so far, it's mostly about permaculture trainings. And there's Kingston Transition, which is a little south of where we are, and I've talked to some of those folks, and they're, you know, just kind of finding their way. So I haven't really been myself in a kind of really up and running uh, transition community. Um, so what I'm going to say here, you know, it, you know I want to put some pretty strong caveats on it, right, because, um, you know, I think people like Sophie Banks are really doing a lot of stuff with inner transition, and I don't really know a lot about what she's done. I couldn't really find a lot of information on that, but I, I know it's out there, so I really want to put that caveat out pretty strong. Um, but first of all, you know, it seems to me that there's a lot of convergences, right? I mean, we're both kind of aiming at a a different society, right? Some sort of transition process. Um, but it's really about how we understand our existing society and what we think that transition process looks like. What are the elements of that transition? And maybe we've got some different views about that and maybe we could find some convergence or cross-fertilization or something. So, so I'm thinking sort of in two p parts here. So what can transition show radical eco-psychology, right? And so I just, you know, just scratched out a few things. Um, you know, what I love about transition is that it's got on with it, right? It, it's actually doing it, 
Um, and you know, if we go back here, a lot of eco-psychology is here. And how do we get, if the goal is an ecological society, then, you know, this needs to happen. We need to be doing a lot of that, right? So we can do a lot of green spirituality here. We can do a lot of shamanic work. We can go on under real journeys. We can do all sorts of stuff. But how does that, how do we connect the dots to a new society from there, right? And so one of the things I like about transition is that they're actually, they're working on it. They got, they, they're getting going. They're not waiting around, right? Um, okay. So, um, you know, in that whole reskilling process, I think that's, you know, beautiful. And, and that in itself is psychologically transformational, you know, from my own sort of sense of that, from my own wee little homestead that Jill and I are working on. Um, I, I know there is a political strategy in transition. It is thinking about that society corner, right? Um, keep it positive, create a buzz, sort of seduce the politicians in, right? So that they'll go for policies that they might not otherwise have gone for. Um, it seems to me a very um, creative and playful and life-filled kind of movement. And so that's really regenerating a kind of life world. Um, you know, that we need, because in order to experience intimacy with the natural world, including our own nature, you know, we need experiences that are soulful and beautiful and unitive, right? Um, and I, I think it, you know, from what I can gather about the transition movement, it seems to all be, you know, really making that important, right? So I think there's a lot that eco-psychology can learn from that. Um, now, the other way around, what can, trans what can radical eco-psychology show transition? You know, this is where I'm a little more nervous, right? <laughs> um, um, one of the things um, that I think is problematic about looking at it in this way is there's a tendency to shuttle between these things, right? Um, we'll, we'll do some inner work and then we'll do some social change work and then we'll go do something over here. And so I think the vision of a society that puts the care for life right into the structure of the society uh, is maybe something a little different, right? And um, maybe there's room for um, some dialogue there, right? About um, putting that... Um, Um, those new s structures or those new cultural forms right into the transition activity, right? And trying to find ways to do that. Um, because radical eco-psychology kind of frames the problem somewhat differently. Um, you know, it's not about specific issues like climate change and um, the economic downturn and peak oil, which are sort of the big three for transition as far as I understand. It's more about this systematic violation of life, you know, that's going on um, under capitalist social relations. And so um, it's really about creating these, um, I call them subjective conditions. It's about creating a new kind of subject, a new kind of person, right, that's capable of participating in this transition. And that requires um, three kinds of literacy that are really, I think, the same. So ecological literacy, psychological literacy, and political literacy. Right? And all of those, to my mind, are um, different aspects or moments of nature literacy. Right? Um, Aristotle said, we're by nature political animals. Right? And psychological literacy is literacy about nature from the inside. So these are all forms of nature literacy. And for me, I want to be involved in a movement that's got people who have full-on literacy in those three ways, calling that nature literacy. Um, and so, you know, perhaps there's some room for a little dialogue there as well. Um, and then finally, you know, um, peak oil, 
uh, climate change, economic downturn, you know, what unites those three things for me is capitalism, right? So if you're going to make those your three um, starting points, that's what you're responding to, then really you're responding to capitalism by my way of thinking. Um, and so maybe that raises some questions about the, the political analysis or, or strategies within transition. And again, maybe there's a little room for dialogue there. Uh, but I'll leave it there and we'll get the conversation going. What did I do? 45 minutes? That's it. <laughs>